I want to welcome everyone tonight to the next in a series of Everyone Has a Story, a virtual speaker series. Uh, we've got to thank the, the rabbi, Alvin Delovich, and Stu Gutman, who have organized and, and set up this program, which has been great. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing a friend of mine, Harry Vollmer. Harry and I uh, have been working the last few years with the Kotzenuk Men's Club. And basically, because we could not meet over the last two years, it's because of Harry and his technical expertise that we've been able to partake in our activities virtually on Zoom. And it's been through his efforts and hard work and what we organized in the newsletter that we flourished over the last two years. And it's been a pleasure and I enjoy working with him and he's a great friend. Uh, Harry was born in Romania. He immigrated to Israel with his uh, parents in 1951. They settled in Old Jaffa. Later, they moved to a moshav called Kadima near Netanya. He served in the military as an officer and participated in the Six Day and Yom Kippur Wars. Following his military service, he studied at the Technion in Haifa, where he graduated in electric engineering. In 1972, he moved to Brem in Northwest Germany, where he worked for Krupp Atlas as a computer design engineer. In 1977, he settled in Montreal, Canada, married to Francine and is residing in Brossard, Quebec. His career has been mainly in information technology and in entrepreneurship and sales and consulting, uh, project and data, data center management in Montreal, Prague, Clearwater, Florida, and Atlanta, Georgia. He's traveled. He's a member of the Social Jewish community where he serves as vice president with on, the Honorable Jacques Sada, who is president. It gives me great pleasure to present my good friend, Harry Bolner, who will talk about his experience in the Yom Kippur War. Harry? Thank you, David. Uh, thank you all for being here. I hope you're all feeling well and safe. I'd like also to thank Alvin for inviting me to speak today and for Stu for the uh, organization uh, of the Zoom meeting. The 1973 Yom Kippur War, or the Ramadan War, as the Egyptians call it, reshaped the Middle East and had a significant role leading to a peace between Egypt and Israel in 79, and then with Jordan in 94, and recently with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco. The Yom Kippur War was undoubtedly the most difficult and costliest war of Israel since its founding, it had poli huge political, military, and intelligence repercussions, which reverberate still to this very day. I served in the 1967 war when I was in the normal army duty and regretted not having a photograph for those historical moments. Immediately, a, fo uh, um, uh, a camera to photograph those historical moments. Immediately after the war, I bought my first camera. By 1973, I had a 35 millimeter still and an eight millimeter camera, which I used to take photos when not in action. So if you ask yourself the question, how come you took photos in war? Well, when I was not in action, documented what I saw around me. Recently, I put them in a digital presentation and added maps that you will see most of them uh, tonight. It is my personal documentary of events as I saw them during the war. 47 years have passed, memories and film fade. I see it as my duty to our communities in Israel and the diaspora to know our history and struggle for a Jewish homeland. The Suez Canal crossing that I participated in with Arik Sharon was called Operation, Operation Abirei Lev or Mifza Abirei Lev in Hebrew, which meant stout hearted men. That's the name of the operation. So I'll start with the sharing of my presentation. And I hope you all can see it. Okay. This is the Suez Canal. That's the day of the crossing on the early, in the dawn of the 16th of October, 1973 about the Yom Kippur, the presentation. I'll talk about the background to the war to get the feeling, where did we come from? Why did we have this war? 
the story about the war when Egypt and Syria attacked simultaneously the 6th of October at about uh, quarter to two local time in Israel. I was living in Germany at the time. So I tried to go and find my unit, which uh, I knew should be operating around the Suez Canal. But my first deployment was to protect Jerusalem, which was strange. I was transferred subsequently to the Sinai front. We crossed the Suez Canal with Arik Sharon's uh, division between two Egyptian armies and behind Egyptian lines. And we sat for several days behind enemy lines in Egypt while the rest of the army was fighting in the Sinai. We held up, our mission was to hold on to the bridgehead until the bridges were built and the rest of the army can cross over. Then we, we scouted to Ismailia, Egypt, which is kind of the capital of the canal, apart from three big cities, there's Port Said in the north, Ismailia, the administrative center, and the Suez, uh, the south of the Gulf of Suez. Then came the UN broken ceasefire and I returned to Germany. That is my story. Uh, at the end of the Six Day War, uh, we see that we have a good 200 kilometer buffer zone between us and Beersheba approximately in Israel, which was Egypt, we captured Egypt. We were sitting on the Suez Canal all the way down to the Red Sea and uh, the Straits of Tehran over here, Sharm el Sheikh at the bottom. We have uh, the West Bank uh, was uh, taken over in the Six Day War and the Golan Heights. Today, most people prefer to call it uh, Judea Samaria, part of it is called Palestine and so on. So this is the map at the beginning of the war. The Six Day War, I just mentioned, Gamal Abdel Nasser is president, big loss uh, 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 for him and for his country, huge loss. Then in 67, uh, there is the Khartoum Arab League summit, which issued three no's, no peace, no recognition, no negotiation. By September 1970, Abdel Nasser dies and Sadat takes power. Sadat says, I'm willing to sacrifice 1 million soldiers to recover lost territory. Hafez al Assad that Syria wants a military option of returning the Golan. Uh, in 68 to 70, Egypt initiates the 1000 day war of attrition. People forget about that war. It was a non-stop war, more or less like the First World War, people shooting on each other, the borders don't move, both sides on the canal. I remember being at the beach in Tel Aviv or Natanya and watching phantom jets fly low over the water on bombing runs to Suez Canal and coming home for lunch. That was the thousand day war of attrition and artillery bombardment non-stop, uh, them and us uh, like the First, war, First World War. In September 1970, the Jordanian army uh, goes against uh, the PLO headed by Arafat. And that period is remembered as Black September when Jordan could not sustain uh, a state within a state. And they kicked uh, Arafat out and out to Lebanon where he found new refuge. In 71, uh, Barlev, uh, the chief of staff creates a defense line after the war of attrition, a defense line along the Suez Canal, which was labeled the Barlev line. Sadat started rebuilding the Egyptian military with Soviet help. The Soviet were always interested in the Middle East and they're trying to regain uh, a foothold, a reputation that they lost in the Six Day War when three Arab countries or more uh, lost everything in six days, lost territory, lost army, lost soldiers. In 1973, student protests erupted in Egypt. Sadat's got to do something uh, to retrieve the honor, the lost honor, honor of Egypt. There are, of course, negotiations going behind the scene, Nixon, Brezhnev, uh, uh, Kissinger, and so on. But Egypt and Syria are actually preparing for war. This is the Barlev line. If you see it over here, these positions along the canal, 
you have uh, Budapest is a northern position in the marshes in the north, Oracle, Lachsanit, Drorak, Tuba, Milano, etc., etc. Uh, notice here there's a place called Matsmed, like you can, on the Great Bitter Lake. This is a small bitter lake, and here's the Gulf of Suez over here. The canal width is about 70 to 100 meters, length is about 190 kilometers. Depth not very be uh, deep, 9 meters, but you can drown in it easily with a tank if it falls off the bridge, and some did. The key players in Israel, uh, just a moment. The key players in Israel are Golda Meir, Moshe Dayan, Ministry of Defense, Lieutenant General David Elazar, Army Chief of Staff, he was former uh, Chief of Command in the Six Day War, General Eli Zaira, Military Intelligence, General Tzvi Zamir, Mossad Chief, and the Angel. The Angel was a spy, Marwan Ashraf. I'll talk about him later. And there's another senior Egyptian spy called Fix. The pre-war intelligence and politics. I have to go through that to give you a feeling on uh, what was the background to the war. Marwan Ashraf, the angel, he was the son-in-law of Nasser, of all people, and in the inner circle of Anwar Sadat. Can you imagine the, the kitchen, political cabinet of Anwar Sadat? And he was a Mossad spy, and he warned of the impending attack. An unnamed senior Egyptian officer spy also warned of the attack. That was six. King Hussein met with Golda Meir two weeks and warned of the impending attack. Iraqi ambassador to Moscow cables home of Syrian participation in planning the attack. Soviet advisors and families are evacuated a week before the attacks. We know about that, we saw that. Our field commanders on the Suez front report Egyptian forces build up. Hundreds of thousand people moving, there's dust, aerial photographs, everything. Their movement of forces to the front in Syria too. Armored and infantry divisions and Soviet SAM missile batteries advance SAMIS surface to air missile. Batteries advance to the front, but are not taken seriously by the intelligence and by the political echelon. Uh, some say, uh, we're so strong, they wouldn't dare beat us. They're still living on the six day war uh, success and they think the Arabs can't fight and they will never try and do something. They think it's only just uh, uh, exercises and trying to scare us. The IDF uh, General Headquarters recommends a preemptive strike when you see this kind of movement on the morning of 6th of October. It was too late, too little, and the forces were not ready at 1 p.m. The intelligence favors of, uh, sources of failures were Arabs' intent and capability to go to war, Mossad, IDF military intelligence, they have the information, but they poorly evaluated it. Military intelligence did not share with regional commands. Can you believe that? Military intelligence did not share with the main commands, the northern, the southern, mainly thinking, of course, Hussein is going to be on the sidelines, so Jordan was not that important. IDF Air Force air surveillance of movements were spotty the week before. There were days that there were cloud uh, clouds and they didn't go out uh, to take photos. Uh, they took photos and uh, were not evaluated on time. Israeli military over confidence was a big thing. I mentioned that. Arab deception. Were they military maneuvers? They were interpreted as routine exercises, were they? On October 6, 1973, the war opening date, Kissinger told Israel, and here's a political angle, not to go for a preemptive strike because it will not be seen favorably in the world, in the world like with the Six Day War. And the Golda Meir confirmed to him that Israel would not do that. True or not? Hesitation by Moshe Dayan and Golda Meir to declare war and wait for things to happen. And on top of that, there was, in the military sense, military unpreparedness. We'll talk about that later. Many books were written. Here are two books that are uh, showed up as important. The Watchman Fell Asleep by Uri Bar Yosef. He's a professor on security issues at the University of Haifa. And the Agil, uh, the Egyptian spy who saved Israel. Uh, you see him 
close to uh, Sadat uh, in Egypt, also written by Uri Bar Yosef. The key Egyptian and Syrian players, Anwar Sadat in Egypt, Field Marshal Ismail Ali, Minister of War, Saad El Shazli, Chief of Staff, and Mohammed Abdel Ghani Agamasi. In Syria, you have Hafez al Assad, the father of the current president, Bashar, General Mustafa Atlas, Minister of Defense. And here you see the, the, the three compadres, uh, Sadat, uh, Hafez Assad, and Hussein. October 6, 1973, around 2 p.m., Yom Kippur war breaks out. People are in synagogue. Uh, people are called uh, by the army starting around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, depending on the units, the Air Force, uh, tanks, artillery, infantry, uh, to head to the units. Syria attacks in the Golan Heights, 100 airplanes, 188 artillery batteries. An artillery battery is four cannons, so multiply that by four. How many cannons were there? Total five divisions. A division is about three brigades, and a brigade is about three battalions, and these numbers can be even greater depending upon the mission. The initial Syrian attack was with 28,000 troops, 800 tanks, and 600 artillery pieces. Israel and the Golan, Yom Kippur, all is quiet, snoozing, 3,000 troops, 180 tanks, and 60 artillery pieces, totally unprepared. Egyptian attack in the Sinai, they called it Operation Badr. 200 airplanes attacked airfields and anti-aircraft batteries, kind of like we did to them in the Six-Day War, but they attacked airfields in the Sinai, not in Israel. 2,000 artillery pieces fired during 53-minute barrage. Imagine that. A true Russian style attack. 32,000 infantry with anti tank rockets start the crossing. The first tanks cross, uh, go across with newly built bridges at 20 30. At 8 30 in the evening, they're already into the Sinai. We had, they had 100,000 soldiers. We had 450 soldiers of the Jerusalem Brigade, Khativat Sioni, in 16 positions, 290 tanks. That is all. That is all against 100,000 people, and they were swamped. Even though they had a good Barlev line, but which was criticized later as too scarce, too few. And here you see the Egyptian attack, the red arrows over here. The Navy created the blockade. Uh, airfields were hit by the uh, airplanes, our airfields by their airplanes. And you have, you have here the third army, in the bottom here and the second army over here, Egyptian army. In Syria, things were even worse because we don't have the 200 kilometer buffer. We had about 20, 30 kilometers to get to the Kinere, to the Lake of Galilee. And there, they could have taken the whole gun, driven all the way to Haifa. There was nobody there. Yom Kippur, how many soldiers guarding that place over there? And look at this massive strength pouring and we knew that there were that many over there and military intelligence uh, not military uh, yeah military intelligence did not pass on the information and did not take it seriously and look what happened i will not go to all the detail of uh, the attack over here but uh, they overran our positions uh, soldiers died sacrificed there they fought to the last bullet if they could, those that when they couldn't anymore, they gave up. Uh, the key thing on the strategy of the Egyptians is they analyzed the Israeli army with the Russians, of course, and they saw that we have a strong air force and we have a strong uh, armored brigades, tanks. So they countered it with uh, surface to air missile batteries positioned on the Egyptian side, close to the canal, which gave a radius of about 30, 50 kilometers into the Sinai. And the SOL teams were equipped heavily with SAGAR guided missiles. They're uh, missiles by wire that a soldier uh, shoots, uh, points and shoots this missile. And with the wire, it's guided uh, to the tank. Uh, and our tanks were really hit very hard with that. 
and uh, they had lots of soldiers, lots of missiles, and our Air Force lost many planes trying to attack their SAM sites uh, because of their anti-aircraft fire. On the 7th of October, there was an Israeli counterattack by Adan uh, Division, and it, it failed to repulse. The 9th to the 13th of October, the front stabilizes more or less. And here's a trick, the Egyptians could not go too far out into the Sana. They wanted to, but they couldn't because they were out of the air defense. And uh, one general wanted, uh, uh, Sadat wanted them to move forward and general said, no, we can't. If we move forward, we're gonna lose our uh, protection of umbrella of SAM missiles and uh, we'll be hunted by the Israeli airplanes. And uh, actually it happened that they tried to move out from their positions. And that's when uh, the pickings were easy. Our uh, tanks did a counteroffensive and uh, they knocked a good part of the Egyptian army out at that time. One of the successes that we don't talk about and we don't hear is the Navy. It's not part of my presentation, but the Navy, which uh, failed, you might say failed in the Six Day War, were very successful with their missile boats in the uh, both uh, in Egypt uh, ports and Latakia in Syria uh, during the Yom Kippur War. But I'll just show the slide to show that uh, they succeeded in knocking down uh, many Egyptian uh, uh, ships. Uh, who are the participants? Well, it's not just Egypt and Syria. Jordan symbolically participated towards the end of the war. They were not in the war, but they joined so-called Arab solidarity kind of thing. Iraq tried to get involved. Saudi Arabia was involved in the Syrian front. Libya sent units, Kuwait, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, even our friendly Cuba, not to mention support by the Soviet Union. Israel had the United States as support mainly. Now about my story. Uh, my role in the war, I'm an artillery battery commander in peacetime and forward fire support and liaison officer in wartime. My rank is captain in the reserves at the time. I was in an airborne artillery battalion, 343, called number 343, with 120 millimeter heavy mortars, Israeli made. I am with a, reg a regiment or brigade, depending if you use the British or the American word for it, uh, 247 under Colonel Dalimat. In the Six Day War, it was called the 55th Airborne Brigade, known as uh, Liberators of Jerusalem. They liberated Jerusalem, this brigade, in the 67 War. So they have a glorious history and they were formed, this brigade were formed just like my unit we talked earlier on. Uh, about uh, two weeks, one month before the war started, this unit uh, was formed. We were part of a bigger umbrella of the armored division guided by Sharon, uh, directed by Sharon, General Arik Sharon, the 143rd Armored Division. Here's Sharon, uh, formerly uh, head of the Israeli army, Chaim Barlev. Now he deposed. Uh, he was deposed Shmuel Gonen during the war and he took over Southern Command Chief. Avraham Adan, Kalman Magen, uh, my, the commander of my commander was called Danny Matt from the paratroopers. My story begins here. I'm living in Germany. I graduated a year earlier from the Technion in 72 in Haifa. I traveled Europe with a backpack and started working in Bremen, North Germany, for an electronics firm, which is marine and computer electronics. Uh, on the 6th of October, Yom Kippur day, I'm in synagogue with my cousin and we step out during a break. He's a smoker and we sit in the car. I open the doors and we hear on the radio that war broke out in the Middle East. Hmm. And in the Syria and the Egyptian crossed the canal. To me, the Egyptian crossing canal meant something serious because just the year before, I practiced crossing a wide body of water, 
in other words, the canal. We practiced crossing such a thing. And I knew that if there's war, I designed a fire uh, plan uh, on uh, crossing a canal. And I thought I must be there with my unit to join and, and uh, activate this plan because I'm sure we're going to cross the canal. Uh, at the close of Yom Kippur, I contact the Israeli embassy. I have no phone, no cellular in those days, 1973, not in my room. And I go down to the payphone and I call the embassy in Bonn and describe my position and my desire to join my unit. They say, I am not a priority. Are you a pilot? No. Are you a tank commander? No. Okay, you're not priority. I don't take no for an answer. I go and get some grilled chicken. I break the fast. I drive to Braun, 350 kilometers south and present myself at the embassy gate. I arrived there like two o'clock in the morning to be told by the security guy in the intercom, go home, we don't need you, no priority. Still undeterred, I go to the railway station with my car, I have a sleeping bag with me, I sleep in my car at the rail station. Next morning, I go back to the embassy, can I go to Israel? I said, no, go back home to Bremen. I keep trying till Tuesday, 9th of October, when they tell me, Yes, now you can go. So by Wednesday, I book a ticket. On the 10th of October, I fly to Frankfurt there via Alta Tel Aviv. I arrive in Tel Aviv airport. I hitchhike to my unit near the airport. There the soldiers are loading up on vehicles with mortars. Not sure of their mission, but heading to the Jordan Valley, which perplexed me as there was no fighting there. Of course, I'm in civilian uh, clothes with a suitcase. I have no uniform, no boots, no gun, no maps, no nothing. I said, okay, I'll call my parents, cousin and neighbors in Kadima and ask them to pick me up. Of course, I surprised my parents and they thinking I'm in Germany and there suddenly I'm on their doorstep, uh, ready to go to war. And of course it's a, a hot, uh, it was an emotional meeting at the least I can say. They were totally surprised. I'm a sole child to my parents and they thought I was out there safe in Germany. And here I came back to the war. They say, our son is crazy. Yet, despite knowing that I was safe in Germany by intuition, and my mother had a lot of it, she ironed my uniform and my father polished my boots. I said, okay, I'll head out next morning. I have my uniform, I have my boots. I can go out and uh, search for my unit. In the meantime, on the front, uh, by the 10th of October, that Wednesday, uh, things are stabilizing, but we had hundreds of people dead every day. I was in Germany when it started, 6th, the 7th, the 8th, the 9th, the 10th. The war was terrible on both fronts. We lost hundreds of people a day, hundreds of people a day. I'm here's a picture. This is from a film I took uh, with my parents on uh, outside the house. They're walking me uh, to my neighbor's car where I, he takes me to the main highway. And there I start hitchhiking all the way to where my unit told me they would be near Jericho. So here I'm standing here with another soldier who took the picture. I'm standing waiting on the Jerusalem Jericho highway to go inland over here. Uh, somewhere over here is my unit uh, in the desert. This is where my unit should be around this area over here. This is called Nebi Musa. It's a Muslim traditional place of uh, where they, uh, uh, they believe that uh, Moses was buried, died and was buried over here. Uh, Nebi Musa means Navi Moshe, the Moshe Rabbeinu in the Jordan Valley. And the unit is close by over here. It's a nice complex over here. It's on the Jerusalem, uh, uh, south of the Jerusalem Jericho Highway. And here's my stuff I'm carrying with me. I find my unit, that's the next day in the morning, sunrise, the unit is under camouflage. Uh, some guys are still sleeping in, some guys writing a letter over here. Here you have a sukkah, you have here uh, Armona Kodesh, uh, the, the books in here, it's a military, uh, uh, case where the Torah scrolls are in and here you have breakfast being served down below in the in the valley over here and here you see civilian trucks which were mobilized for the war effort and uh, the rest of the unit is under camouflage uh, 
shaving, uh, washing up and shaving in the morning. Now, this is the 12th of October, Friday, and there's the war going on. We see nothing over here. We're sitting over here, we're eating, we're shaving, and on the Syrian front and the Egyptian front, hell is broken loose over there, and we feel nothing of that over here. Breakfast is being served. Bazooka training, bazooka, Second World War bazooka. We are still training with Second World War equipment. And the Egyptians have the latest, most modern guided missile. This is an anti-tank weapon. They've got guided by wire missiles uh, that they hit our tanks. And we're still going with these uh, tubes. We, we have to go down to Jericho and bring uh, fresh water because we have no water. So you have to go down to Jericho to the police station or an army base there to get water. And coming from Germany, I say, I'm going to stop by this guy and get myself a good falafel while I'm there. And, uh, and then we get orders to go to the central command in Ramallah, uh, which is north of Jerusalem. And I take a photo from the bus here on uh, approximately Malia Dumim. It's a, now it's a big uh, uh, community, Malia Dumim. And you see here soldiers digging up on uh, the ridge. And it finds out that there are no soldiers between Jerusalem and the border. In other words, we're fighting in the Golan, Syria. We're fighting in the Sinai, Egypt. And Jordan can drive to Jerusalem in less than half an hour if they cross the river. There are very few soldiers along the Jordan River. Yes, there are units. But here where we drove, we didn't see any units. We drove down from almost Jericho all the way to Jerusalem. And we saw no units over there on the way. Except those guys digging there, which are probably reservists. We pass the Temple Mount. We go through East Jerusalem. We see the Hasidim returning from the synagogue. It's uh, Sukkot. And we come to Central Command. We get new orders. Uh, I found out uh, that when I arrived to my unit uh, in, the, in Jericho, in the, I found out that my position of Battalion Operations Officer, I was promoted while I was in Germany to Operations Officer. And it had been assigned to another officer uh, since I was in Germany. My new orders is I'll be assigned to a special battalion of officers who, like me, are arriving from abroad and orphaned from the unit, like myself. We get the mission to dig foxholes on both sides of the Jericho-Jerusalem highway to stop any attempt by Jordan to join the war and attack Jerusalem. Only 30 kilometers away. That's not far, guys. So we are supposed to dig foxholes, get ourselves uh, anti-tank weapons like you saw, like the bazooka, and wait for the tanks to roll up the hill to go to Jerusalem. And we shoot and we stay there. We are either dead or captured, but we don't give up. That is the orders. But as these orders are being handed out to me, we're getting new orders. We're getting new orders to deploy to the Sinai. Apparently they must have decided that Hussein or we're convinced that Hussein is not going to join the war. The new orders are, we're going to be fire and support liaison officers reporting to our Airborne Brigade 247, which is our organic unit, by the way. But in war, units are split and they sent to right, left, north, south. Doesn't matter, you belong here, you belong there. They're combined with other units. And, and in this war, it was totally chaotic and uh, similar things happened. Uh, units that were disintegrated during battle. Uh, some units lost three quarters of their uh, um, men and machinery that uh, they combined with other units to form new units and were assigned to new units and so on and so on. So now we're part of Sharon's 143rd Division, which has to fight intense battles to block the Egyptian advance. As you see here, the three divisions are done in the north, fighting the second army, Sharon in the center, and again in the south, fighting the third army over here, which is coming across from Egypt. So uh, we're going down to the Sinai. We're going to a new front. Uh, we are all uh, front uh, liaison officers. In other words, we go with the fighting units and we help in directing the fire on the enemy, which could include artillery and air force and uh, airplanes on uh, the enemy. 
So we are having uh, a good hummus over here in uh, Jericho in an Arab restaurant and we're off to the war. We're passing by uh, the Dead Sea. We're driving along the Dead Sea in buses. We go up the Arava. We are reach Beersheba and we get uh, fresh uh, refreshments from volunteers at all the intersections, free. They give soldiers refreshments, uh, food and drink because everybody's moving in all directions. Here is us, a close up of our guys over here. This guy is a colleague of mine, Hanan Davidson, and this is a signal guy. He saved his life in one battle I'll talk about later. The guys, they are signal men uh, with us, drivers. On October the 14th, on Sunday, the first major successful armored attack, counterattack uh, by the three divisions, and the tide of war is being turned right now. By the 15th, 16th, General Arik Sharon receives approval to cross the canal uh, for the 16th, 15th, 16th at night. We're waking up on the 15th of October in the Mitla Pass. There are three main passes, actually there are four, but the three main passes through mountains in the Sinai going from east to west or west to east. Uh, these, uh, these passes, you have to go through them because the rest is mountainous or sandy and uh, there are roads there. But because we're afraid of Egyptian Air Force, which have been prowling the area, we sleep under this ridge over here. That's me over here. Here's the other guys of my unit. We're all in the ledge, underneath the ledge over here. And then we start going to the canal. You see the traffic, the horrendous traffic over here. It's not a highway, it's just a one asphalt road. This is a 175 millimeter uh, uh, tank in front of, uh, artillery gun in front of us. Uh, and we're moving west towards the canal. Look at the snailing, the snake over here of, Tanks, trucks, civilian tenders, pickups, uh, whatever you want, all driving towards the canal over here. You find here a, a workshop or field repair center fixing tanks. Uh, what happened when the war started, uh, we were caught by surprise, obviously. Normally, tanks are taken to the front on carriers, uh, big uh, trucks which uh, have a trailer and the tank is on the trailer, like you see a caterpillar being towed over here, and they're towed towards uh, the area where they're supposed to be. But uh, there were none. They weren't ready. They weren't there. Uh, units got tanks without machine guns, got units without binoculars, uh, and they drove on their tracks from Israel, actually from Israel, all the way to the Sinai towards the front. And these tracks don't last long. Uh, driving like that through the, the ground and they lost many tracks and they have to replace the tracks and so on. October 14, 15, uh, Egyptian attacks and Israeli counterattacks. Here finally, as I mentioned, Sharon uh, succeeded and uh, they knocked out 270 tanks and 200 armored vehicles destroyed. Israelis had less than 40 Israeli tanks hit and all were repaired except for a dozen. And now Sharon receives the permission to cross the canal, which is contentious because he tried to do it without permission. There was infighting between the generals, between the, uh, his commanding officer. He was a formerly the commander of the Southern Front and he gave it the command uh, front to Gonen, which is called Gorodish. And uh, he was fighting with Gorodish and Sharon was previously Gorodish's superior. Now Gorodish is Sharon superior, there was issues over there. Sharon refused orders supposedly, and he did his thing, but he's a brilliant general and he makes plans to cross the canal uh, between two Egyptian armies, between the second in the north and the third. It's like on a tennis court, you have uh, two players, uh, doubles, and the ball goes on the middle line. And the question is who's gonna pick up the ball? So that's what happened over here, Sharon, picked an area between the two armies and went on that uh, area to cross the canal. So we are preparing now. Now we're not close to the canal. We arrived there in buses. We had no half tracks. These are Second World War half tracks, white, made by a company called White, half tracks. 
we had no half tracks. There was no equipment. Uh, our commanding officer uh, sent a, a battalion commander to go and uh, how do you say uh, steal or borrow or something uh, tracks from a depot somewhere in the Sinai. He did that and he came with first 30 and then we got 60 half tracks. We're talking about a regiment going to cross the war into Egypt and we don't have equipment, we don't have nothing to drive on. It's terrible. So uh, this is a guy from our unit over here, uh, paratrooper unit, and we're in a staging area, we're waiting. Here are tanks in the front from Khativar Baisi, the 14th Brigade, Armored Brigade, protecting us the, towards the north. North is there, that's the second army, and to the south of us, behind me, is the third Egyptian army. Here you see uh, Katyushas that Israel captured in the Six Day War. We formed a battalion of Katyushas. You see here the little tanks on the on the ridges over here, uh, uh, fighting, not defending, but fighting over here to open the corridor for us to advance. And then the Katyushas start firing on the canal zone over there on the troops to get us close to the canal. Here's one of our uh, planes, a Skyhawk, uh, on bombing runs uh, on the units uh, on the north east of us, uh, northwest of us, uh, close to the canal, that are trying to close that back with a, with a pincer movement to block us from north and south from getting to the canal. But they don't realize that yet, the, how much in trouble they are yet. They all they see we're advancing. And we're by now we're more or less behind enemy lines. Here we find we're still waiting here on the sidelines. We find here tanks towing uh, some motorized pontoons. Every one of these pontoons, when you drop in the motor in the water, they have a motor. Uh, they have an independent motor, and they shuttle back and forth, go back and forth, and then you can connect them afterwards one with the other and form a rough bridge with it. So here you have. Uh, tanks uh, towing these things, another regiment were towing them. We're getting our uh, orders on the evening by the shadows at say like five o'clock in the afternoon. This is our artillery group. We're assigned to the paratroopers. Everyone is sent, every officer is sent to another unit to be their fire support and liaison officer. My commanding officer is Major Uri Wagman in uh, peacetime. He is a famous criminal defense lawyer. So here we are. This is uh, getting close in the evening. Uh, you see in the south, we have the third Egyptian army. Our tanks are all on the ridge over here fighting to clear the road for us. The second Egyptian army is on the right. We're all crowded over here. And the crossing happens on this midnight, one o'clock in the morning on the 16th of October. Uh, our artillery battalions pounded the crossing area with a rolling uh, rolling curtain of fire, uh, a rolling curtain that moved forward by various commands to clear the way so that make sure that nothing is standing there to block us when we cross the canal. A scout company passes across the canal, paratrooper, in Zodiacs, which are rubber dinghies with, with the Navy. Combat engineers cross for mine clearance, 20 tanks and seven APCs, armored personnel carriers, across also, and go four to 12 kilometers into Egypt, taking the Egyptians by surprise. Arik Sharon, division headquarter, crosses too. His whole division headquarter, Israeli style, has gone only six cars, six motor vehicles, and Danny Matt's brigade headquarters. This is the picture that I showed in the beginning of the presentation. That's myself over here. We're seeing various vehicles in front of us being loaded, crossing the canal. After the pounding over there of the canal, there's not much resistance. It's awfully quiet, sounds peaceful. But behind us, 20, 30 kilometers behind us, people are dying, people being shot, firing going all the time. But here it's very peaceful. And here you see the shuttle of this pontoon going back and forth, dropped people and tanks on the other side and coming back to pick us up. 
soon our turn comes. This is the two of our guys over here. Now our turn to come up, that's me crossing over here. This is the Egyptian side. The smoke is from the engines, not from firing over here, the smoke. We cross over here. This is my friend, Hanan Davidson. He made it before me. He crossed first. We dig into a eucalyptus, eucalyptus grove. The artillery fire on us at the bridgehead. And so we all have to dig into this artillery grove. Um, the Battle of Seraphim. In that, uh, uh, it's a sad story. Uh, a scouting unit uh, drove up on the railway, uh, Suez Ismailia, that means south going north Ismailia, uh, ran to a strong Egyptian position. Uh, they misread their location and they were pinned down under heavy Egyptian fire. A second reinforcement is sent, they're pinned down too. I'm sent to the third unit to extract them out. We succeed in extracting them under heavy fire. When I arrive over there, I see like a dozen men with blankets covered over them. I only see the red paratrooper boots sticking out, dead, died over there in that uh, thing. That's the first time I actually see uh, the uh, people hurt in this war because uh, on the Jordanian side, uh, everything was quiet. Coming from Germany, I missed the first week of the war, but this time, this is serious. And uh, Hanan Davidson got uh, hurt over here with a bullet in the neck and his signal man, uh, Hamoudi is called, he held his hand on his neck to stop his blood from, uh, from flowing and got him to safety and saved him. A troop carrier was still on the railway tracks, exposed to the enemy fire. Two other officers and I called in a tank, an old Sherman, to tow it away. And we are holding a heavy tow line on top of this exposed railway track. A shell is fired at us. I'm not sure if it was an RPG or a, a missile tank type thing. Uh, but luckily, it landed in the sand. That's nice in the desert. If it sits in the sand, uh, it blows a lot of sand in your face, but uh, you don't get killed so much from it. And we both flew in the air. Three of us flew in the air. Uh, a shrapnel cut the left trap of my helmet, an inch of my ear, but I never lost a drop of blood from this whole thing. We gave up on this uh, half track and cleared the area. Uh, my half track was uh, had gone with the dead and the wounded. The, uh, the wounded were cleared first and the dead later. And my cameras were in that thing. So of course, uh, don't expect me to film in the meantime when people were, uh, were in the middle of a battle like that. Our communications officer, Macy Schreiber is shot that night in wounded in a bombing in the, in the uh, eucalyptus grove. And another fellow officer that I hitchhiked with uh, there he was killed in a direct hit, which I won't describe. We're deployed the next day to a strategic northernmost position of the bridgehead. That is the northernmost position of the holding that we have at the bridgehead in Egypt, while to the right of us is Sinai and the east and the west is Egypt and uh, Cairo is not that far away. So I joined another unit this time a paratrooper company holding the northernmost position, position called Alif Adom. The name Alif Adom, I forgot since the war and only about three months ago, some fellow veterans on social media on Facebook uh, showed me my position where I was, it was Alif Adom. Our orders were to protect the bridgehead, a pure defensive position, no, uh, no aggressivity in our part, just to make sure that they don't attack uh, the bridgehead so the bridges can be built and the rest of the army can cross. In the north of us over here, this is an Egyptian position over here. And we don't do anything to it. We just, we're staring at each other and see what happens. This is the map, the regimental map, and this is the position Alif Adom. This is the 
Aleph means Aleph, red Aleph, Adam. This is the bridgehead position. This is the crossing area about four kilometers to the south. Sorry, over here was a crossing. And then there was another crossing over here. And here was an area called the Chinese farm. A major battles happened at the Chinese farm. Many paratroopers died in this Chinese farm. So here we're observing battles and nothing is, nobody's shooting at us. We're not shooting at anybody across and east of the Suez Canal in the Sinai around the Chinese farm area. That's me here from the film you'll see later. I'll show you the film, six minute film at the end of the presentation and you'll see uh, some of these pictures in there. I'm reporting to HQ what I see on the battle on the Sinai side. Uh, there's a, a tank uh, a regiment pushing forward, actually the battalion of a tank regiment pushing the Egyptians forward, the second army northwards and fighting them. They're trying to close in from the south and the north as a pincer movement. And we are trying to move them sideways uh, as uh, at the same time. So here's one of those tanks charging forward and firing. And there are more tanks beside him, but not in my view. Uh, since I have the best view on the battle that's raging on the Sinai side and the Chinese farm, the regimental commander, Colonel Danny Matt uh, from the paratroopers, my own commander are here. Uh, and we're uh, discussing what we're seeing across on the Sinai side. It's a great viewpoint. The Egyptian position is still there. Uh, they're not doing anything and we're not doing anything. The fighting moves during the day further north. You see the smoke from burning vehicles going north. We're kind of quiet here. This is a captured Egyptian position we're sitting in. We didn't dig it up ourselves. They had some chickens running around uh, and uh, we're over here. Here's a sandbag position here that got hit the night later. And I felt uneasy about that Egyptian commando position north of us over there. And I decided and asked permission, of course, to target that position, but not directly, but beside them, as you see here, the smoke here, that is one of my artillery shells landing over here, not on the position, but close to them, but close enough so I can get a handle on them in case they decide to attack, I'll be easy for me. It'll be easy for me to, to move the fire either over here or over there. So this is my own shell that I landed over here. And uh, I took a picture of that because nothing was happening. And I know a shell is in there about 30, 40 seconds. And uh, when the shell, uh, when they said fire, I counted 30 seconds and I took a picture. But that, Evening, uh, about 8 p.m. the evening, it was foggy. You couldn't see anything. It was milk, white in front of us. We were sitting, having supper, and suddenly hell broke loose. Uh, they started firing at us, and we found out later they had infrared equipment that they could see us. We had no infrared equipment. We weren't equipped differently than we were in the Six Day War. We couldn't see them. They could see us with night vision and uh, they shot up this position and two guys lost their life in this position. And I'm over here and they invited me to join their position. I said, thank you very much, but no, thank you. I'll stay over here. I don't want to bother you guys. Well, that saved my life. The second time right there in two days. The next day, you see my artillery shells. Of course, I launched artillery when they attacked us. So you see the artillery shells that blackened all this area over here and here. They left about 20 dead over here. And uh, we had a bulldozer that uh, buried them. And here I covered here in dark. There are two bodies still lying around here that I didn't want to show in the video, in the presentation. But this is a different position where the commandos came. They came this way to us and tried to get in, to sneak in behind our position. Our position was like a horseshoe. And that same day, the 18th of October, we're not aware of that but they're trying to launch a new bridge into the canal. This is called a roller bridge. A roller bridge is a bridge with cylinders, rolling cylinders connected together, Israeli invention. They worked on it for a couple of years and they push it 
pull it and push it with tanks into the canal. And you see this uh, roller bridge. And the Egyptians then decided, of course, they see this thing. They have their own artillery guys. They have to take this thing out. They cannot let these bridges stand. So they tried to bomb it any way they could with artillery, with airplanes, anything. They even, we even thought they had frogmen coming at us in the canal to sabotage the bridges. So we had uh, guys standing on the bridges, throwing every couple of minutes grenades into the water. Imagine that. And uh, when the airplanes came and they bombed, some of those guys got hit. The bombing was horrific. Luckily, I wasn't in it, but those who were in it uh, still suffer from PTSD today. They were bombed day and night in that position because that was a critical position to get those bridges out of action. So the airplanes came to attack us. So luckily, this is an Egyptian MiG. Israeli Mirages came and shot them down. And uh, I got a couple of pictures here. Here's another guy, another uh, Mirage, a MiG, shot by our Mirages. And here's our famous Egyptian position across from us. And uh, it's going to come down and explode behind the position. And a paratrooper, another plane, and a paratrooper, uh, paratrooper, sorry, uh, the pilot uh, uh, jettisons uh, by parachute uh, in this case. It's quiets down at the end uh, on the east of the canal. The front recedes even further. And you see here uh, on these two maps, similar maps, one is from Wikipedia and the one are from regimental book I received after the war. You, we moved north to Ismailia. Uh, tanks went south over here to Suez and we took over this position up to 101 kilometers from the Suez Canal. And here's the rolling bridge. We are uh, freed up the next day. I think the date is later. It's October the 19th here. It's, I've got to adjust the dates, but you get the gist of it. And we pass by the rolling bridge. You see our shadows over here. You see me photographing here, my shadow here, the camera. You see the antenna behind me over here of my radio. We're crossing by, and this is actually our picture. You see the antenna here, myself here, and I pass the camera to a fellow soldier to take a picture. And we deploy back to headquarters. In headquarters, we have got, oh, we got Yoram Gaon. He came with Dubi Zeltzer to entertain the troops. Fighting is still continuing on the Suez Canal around it uh, to the north on the Sinai side and to the south. We are encircling the Egyptian army. We're encircling a whole army, disconnecting them from their motherland, from Egypt. But here we already have our entertainers have showed up. And here is uh, motorized bridges are coming right now to cross the Sweetwater Canal because all this is a wonderful farmland over here and the Sweetwater Canal, which waters the area. So here you got motorized bridges to cross the canals and you see the form of our position. It's like a horseshoe. So it's low in the back and high in the front facing the Sinai behind me, behind the picture. So uh, the command, the Egyptian commander tried to sneak in from in behind over here to get into our position because they couldn't climb the, the high sand walls. So here we're scouting north to Ismailia. Here you see another position. This is the biggest position, which has got three ramps going up. You see the ramps, one, two, three, going up in the agricultural position here. This is our whole uh, artillery command unit. Uh, we're passing by farmers on the way. We're passing by the Sweetwater Canal. We're passing by military gray site, I suppose, of Egyptian soldiers that died in the war that were buried hurriedly. And the palm uh, identifies that uh, the position of a grave. I don't know if there's a name behind it or whatever. Uh, here's another, going to see another position. And somebody already lift, uh, planted an Israeli flag above. You see how the positions were. The ammunition was generally behind over here and bunkers. And here you drive up with a car up over here and you come down on the other side. Here's another position we visit. Here, this has got brown earth that was brought in here to create a ramp and very rich agricultural land behind us. And here we take a photo of all of us having succeeded, survived the war at this time by 
20, 21st of October. I may be off by a day, I got to adjust it. And this is my signal man with me. Uh, this is intelligence officer, others on driver's communications. This is uh, uh, the officer, uh, Amnon Gottlieb, who replaced me while I was in Germany. He took my position. He uh, did. He stayed at HQ while I was in the front. I'm the guy with the dirty face here in the front. And this is another forward position officer. And about it, yeah. And this is a beautiful uh, sunset uh, picture of our flag. Uh, to demoralize the Egyptians in the Sinai side to show them that we're behind them in Egypt. So this time we are behind their lines, we are covering behind them. And here we see Ismailia, the tomb of the unknown soldier from the First World War. We're close to it in a distance, it's a few kilometers away. It's on the uh, lake. Here you see Diane is showing up. Uh, he showed up a couple of times, but this time we got a picture of him with Arik Sharon driving his Jeep. Uh, dust and glory. Here they're sitting, and I suppose uh, I was here with them in the planning uh, of the, here's my commanding officer, in the planning, discussing uh, the terms and the position of the army before the ceasefire. The upcoming ceasefire should be a ceasefire coming up. Uh, things are quieting down. The third Egyptian army has been encircled. If they don't give up, we said we're going to destroy them. But when they made a ceasefire, uh, we did not destroy them and we supplied them with water. So not our units, other units supplied them. I'm really, at that time, I'm more of a tourist at this time, participating in these meetings, visiting places, but there's no fighting, no shooting as far as I'm concerned. And here's the third Egyptian army, totally surrounded by Israel on all sides and totally dependent on us for water, for survival. Here are the positions. The second army is still occupying the east of the canal on the north and the third army encircled in the south. And we're in Egypt over here. And the brown is in Egypt over here. And the Golan Heights, we extended we captured all the Golan Heights we had before that and pushed into an area called, in Hebrew, Muvlat, which I don't have the English word for that. It is a bulge, it was a bulging area. And we even shot with a cannon, a friend of mine from Montreal here, he was in artillery. He shot with a cannon onto the airport of Damascus. And that scared the hell out of the Syrians that not only can we get them by the Air Force, but we can also get them by ground forces using an artillery cannon. And that was exceptional because then they understood they got to make a ceasefire too. This is Sharon's divisional headquarters. As I said, a whole division, uh, thousands of men. He's got only a few half tracks and uh, uh, M109s and uh, Jeeps and that's it, and lots of antennas. And because of these antennas, we were constant, constantly targeted because Egyptians knew where the antennas were, they could pinpoint them and you kept moving all the time. As they found us, uh, they started shooting at us, so we kept changing location. And we had to fire back on them because we also knew where they are. Here, General Barlev, who is head of Southern Command comes, they open a map on a Jeep. Previously, you saw Diane on the ground with Sharon pointing on a map. And now you have Barlev also, I guess, talking about positions and uh, ceasefire. And here I'm going to show you a movie that I filmed with a Yashica Super 8 millimeter film. It's got no sound, so just uh, no sound in those days. This is what you saw before. We're in the uh, staging area waiting. You see the tanks in front of us on the ridge. Uh, before the crossing of the canal. We're here digging in this soft sand, uh, just in case. Here you see the big uh, uh, pontoons being dragged by the tank. Uh, I showed these pictures in Israel about uh, two months ago to army vets, to uh, the special social media unit. And uh, you see here firing, you see the Skyhawk going in for the attack over here and smoke. 
And they said these are the best color pictures they've seen so far uh, from the war and, and video. And those that suffered PTSD, it didn't help them at all. It reminded them all the hell they went through. Here are the Katyushas firing. Here's the Skyhawks back in action. Here are the tanks fighting in front of us over there on the ridges, trying to clear the path for us. And there's fighting going at the Chinese farm that you don't see here. Here are us crossing the canal. I'm on a half track facing Egypt. The Sinai side is barren. The Egyptian side is green. You see eucalyptus, palm trees. And we called here, we're landing here. We call this Africa. This is a term uh, we Israelis gave to the Egypt. We said we landed in Africa because technically we are in Africa. And if people today ask me, have I visited Africa? I said, yeah, but I don't give the details how I got to Africa. And here's my friend, Hanan Davidson. And here I'm come here. I have to, I decided, uh, I found this little uh, damaged house here. I decided to wash my feet over there because uh, I've been with the same socks a couple of days already. And here we're digging in the, in the uh, eucalyptus grove. That's me over there taking my boots off. And not soon after we start being shelled over there. So I missed two days of being in battle, fighting, shooting, and so on. And now I'm in the position Ali Fadom, uh, viewing, spectator, reporting what goes on the side. I said, all these are Egyptian vehicles over there on the other side. And soon you find our tanks moving forward, driving them forward and uh, this is the map. This is the uh, company officer uh, beside me. We're sitting side by side. This is one of our tanks over here. Oops, I'm pointing. I shouldn't be pointing with the finger. Yeah. One of our tanks moving forward, uh, shooting at the Egyptian army here. Egyptian position is quiet. This is one of our tanks here, firing. Here's another one of ours. All the rest are Egyptian stuff here. It's, uh, it's messy. It's funny, shooting and dying on the other side and all quiet on our side. I didn't have much film. I had only two rolls of film. So my, uh, so I, I pulled the camera trigger very softly. Every time a few, that's myself over here reporting, not shooting at anybody, just reporting what's going on. And the company commander is beside me. The guy who took the picture is the, the signal, uh, my signal man. And here's when the older commanders showed up to, to see what I was seeing from my position over here. This is the position that got hurt the night after that the guys died in it. This is the different position. Soon you'll see my, uh, my shell land over here. There's my shell landing over here. And then more paratroopers are coming in. That's moving northwards from our, uh, from our regiment. They're moving forward. And a tank will be covering them at the edge of a road. There is a tank covering them at the edge of the road over there. And here are the Egyptian MiGs coming to attack. We thought us, but they're not attacking us. They went to attack the bridges that are being built. And here one that got hit. Here's another one. He goes down. And there's another one soon, you'll see. There were five planes. Five planes were shot down above our head. I used the camera to film them. And you hear the rapid fire machine gun of the Mirage. They were not shot shot with, uh, here's the Chinese farm, pumping stations. Here's another plane, another plane over here. And the pilot explained to me that they have, I don't know what, some, uh, some special fuel uh, in a special area that when they burn, they really burn. And here you see the smoke coming behind the position. 
There it goes. Here's another one with a big flame. And uh, a month ago, I sent this film to an Israeli lab to improve on it. And he improved on it. That's it. It's over. And he improved on the film. Now, next one. He improved on the film and he showed it to other pilots. And one pilot identified it that was the planes that he shot. And then he went back to his unit. And I can't show you the video. And he brought and he showed me the video. He sent it to me on WhatsApp of the video of the planes being shot. He shot three planes from the pilot's cockpit. You could see from the pilot's cockpit, they have cameras in front. You could see the planes being shot. And they're similar with the fire of, as of my pictures over here. But uh, I don't know if I could show them or not, so I didn't show them. So by October 24, there's a ceasefire here and you have uh, Barlev, an Egyptian general uh, with a UN uh, office in shorts in the middle of the desert. Uh, saluting each other and agreeing to peace. I'm freed by the 28th of October. I'm let go. I asked permission twice to get back. I, first time I was declined. Second time they allowed me and I went back home to Israel. And there on the way home, I stopped by the hospital to see my two friends that were wounded. He lost a couple of centimeters of his arm in the shelling and eucalyptus grove. He had a bullet in his neck. And here are uh, at the intersection civilians waiting with us at night, 24 hours a day with food and drinks for soldiers going back and forth. Casualties, we lost about uh, 2,800 people, wounded, lots of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We had, uh, captured, we had Syrian, uh, Syrians captured Israelis and Egyptians captured Israelis. Israeli losses, 1,063 tanks, Arab losses, more loss, airplanes, 90 naval vessels as I mentioned, and so on and so on. I don't like to discuss this body counting like Americans did in the, in the Vietnam War. But this war led I can talk for hours on that, but this war led to the peace treaty between Sadat, uh, Carter, and Begin, uh, Camp David, uh, and the Sinai was returned. And this is the end of my presentation. I don't know how long it took. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Harry. Un unbelievable. If any of you have any questions for Harry, you can ask it on the chat. Harry will stay as long as you want if you have questions. So just use chat to put your questions on. How long how long did you stay mobilized before you went back to Germany, Harry? You wouldn't believe it. The whole war for me from October 10 to October 28. 18 days is the whole time I did this whole war. And before that, the six day war. And when I left Germany, I thought to myself, I'm going to the war, I'm coming back uh, in 10 days, in one week. You know, our wars are one week. I also suffered from that mentality that we will beat them in one week like we did in the six day war. It wasn't that kind of a war at all. It was really a ghastly war. And the battle between generals and politicians, I mean, I don't want to spoil the presentation by this discussion, but their books written about it is terrible. How were you able to save all your photos by, from Donna and videos for all your movies, moves around the world? Well, they were one of my most uh, precious uh, photos and things with my parents' photos, my childhood photos, of course. I kept them. I, um, uh, I protected them and I sat on them for 45 years. Uh, because I didn't know who is interested to talk about the Yom Kippur War. Uh, I was too busy to do anything about it. Uh, I was working intensively. But when I retired, I, I knew where my photos and videos were. I took them out and I scanned them. And I decided to make a presentation out of it. First, I showed it to the South Shore Jewish community. And then uh, 
to Spanish and Portuguese, I think, and then et cetera, et cetera, to the Constant Duke Men's Club. And uh, then when I shared them with Israel, they said, wow, you actually have color photos because most of the photos they have are black and white and they're not of the quality of my camera that I brought with me, a 35 millimeter camera for those who are photograph buffs. Interesting. Any other questions? Or if there's no other questions, I'll ask Rabbi Whitman to uh, to thank Harry. I want to thank Harry personally. Thanks so much, Harry. I appreciate it. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you. First of all, David, for helping to arrange this. This is absolutely incredible, Harry. I I have never experienced anything like this. I think that every single one of us of a certain age remembers that day in 1973, remembers that Yom Kippur, where we were, when we found out how we responded, what we felt in the days and weeks after. Of course, very, very few of us actually got on a plane and played a pivotal role in that ultimate victory. You have given us a firsthand account of something that we all know about, but none of us has any inkling into exactly what happened the way that you have shown us today. I think it is not an exaggeration to say that you, Harry, are one of the people to whom we are indebted for Medinat Israel today. Without you and not a whole lot of others like you, I don't know what Israel would be like today. Your account is chilling. It is riveting. And you have brought us with you to the front line in a way that we never would have experienced without your generous time and effort. You are a hero of Israel. Wow. And you have done a tremendous gift to share it with us and with so many others. May you be blessed with a long and happy and healthy life. And may be not Israel continue to thrive based on men and women of your caliber of courage and determination. Harry, thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thanks again, Harry. Thank you again, Rabbi. Thank you. There are some other questions that came afterwards. But a few other questions, if you've got time, I see there. If you want I got to lots of time. If, uh, sure. sure. Uh, on the Barlev Live, there were other positions like Praga 1, Praga 2, Budapest, and others. Where are they? Uh, well, they were on the map, but now they're, it's already turned back to Egypt. The positions have been overrun. I don't know what the Egyptians have done with them. Uh, sometime after the war, I think some uh, veterans went back to those positions to look where they were, but I don't think they're accessible now anymore. Maybe they are, I'm not sure. I've never been back since. What were the repercussions to Sharon for crossing without consent the canal? Well, uh, they wanted to demote him, they wanted to kick him out, uh, everything, but uh, after all is said and done, uh, the move by Sharon uh, going counter current to the war where the Egyptians were going to Sinai, he went back into Egypt behind them. Uh, he saved the war. He closed, he, he shut down the, that war effort. Uh, the Syrians were blocked already and uh, they were nowhere, they were going nowhere. And uh, Sharon, when he crossed over there and showed them they can be in Egypt, he uh, crossed to Cairo. There was no intent of taking any Arab capital, anyhow. So, uh, yeah, so, yeah, he was accused, but he was praised in the end. He was praised. He, he's still seen as the hero of the war. Uh, did you see your parents before going back to Germany? Uh, yes. Uh, after passing by the hospital, I went to see my parents. <laughs> Picked up my suitcase, got my civilian clothes, uh, got some good... Uh, 
uh, food from my parents uh, there. And uh, uh, I have a story about that, if you have time. Uh, during the war, we ate those uh, food, those military meals. And some of the soldiers, believe it or not, in war are, uh, are really uh, picky about their food. I can't believe that. I mean, they would eat the dessert, uh, which are uh, uh, um, grapefruit stuff and eat their meat and stuff. But they wouldn't eat their peas and they won't eat their, uh, their corn. And I loved it. So I said, pass me your peas and pass me your corn. And I ate those uh, canned corn and canned peas. And I come home and my aunt, uh, my mother, my mother's sister says, guess what I made for you? I made for you schnitzel with peas and corn. <laughs> I ate the whole. <laughs> I sat in Egypt eating peas and corn. Okay, I like it. So that was a funny thing. Uh, could you show the Pragas on your first map? Yes, I can. Uh, there's something. Uh, oh, David Ben Susan. Hi, David. Merci. Ta présentation était fascinante et émouvante. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Amen. Toda. Tammy Halpern. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, could you show the Pragas on your first map? Uh, Charles Eklov. Yesterday, in your personal achievements. Thank you for sharing. You are indeed a hero to us all. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Clarence Blatter. 93, Israel were captured. They all returned to Israel safely, yes. Within a few months after the war, they returned to Israel. They were not returned safely. Uh, some of them were tortured very badly, especially on the Syrian side, were tortured very badly, terribly. Uh, and some of those that were captured died. They were tortured, especially the pilots. They had the worst time, the pilots, because they want to get uh, secrets from the pilots. Uh, they wanted to get secrets on uh, atomic weapons, uh, air units and stuff like that. And uh, uh, they died without talking. Uh, and, and, no, I won't say it. There were, there were problems. Uh, Pragas, I'll try and show you the Pragas on, my, on the map, if you allow me just to share one more time. Um, our live line, by live line. Oops, not this one. Hang on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Got to go backwards. I can do it differently. Okay, Praga. Botser, Lakikan, Purkan, Kitsayon, Mifreket. I don't see Praga. Maybe it's a second line or third line because you see there's first line of defense and observation points. There are second lines over here and the third line, which is a, one is called an artillery road where the artillery could change positions along the artillery road. I don't see Praga here. Maybe it was another name at another time or another code name on another map because there were many maps that changed. Uh, the maps I showed you were called the Sirius map. Sirius, uh, like uh, S-I-R-I-U-S, Sirius map. Did you witness a prisoner exchange? No, I was, uh, I was already back in Germany. And when I went to Israel, uh, uh, 2017 and I met my commander uh, from the war and I showed him the presentation uh, I asked him when did you go back home he said we will stay there till March and I was already by November I was back in Germany and I put the war behind me completely behind me and didn't think more about the war I went, got back to work and happy to find my job and my girlfriend and so on so, uh, yeah. Uh, and that was the case for 45 years until uh, my retirement when I took out the pictures and made a presentation and so on. Peter Safran, what a very special night. Thanks to all of you. Thank you all. Thank you all for listening in. 
thank you all. It's not an easy thing to listen to the war. It's uh, it's it's really messy, and I'm happy I didn't get PTSD. Thanks, thanks again, Harry. Much appreciated.